Hi, welcome to Engineering Q Vectors video number four. This is a long video. We're going to discuss the development of Q vectors. We're going to show the events, logic, and reason that led to the need for the what I used to call the new math construct. I had, and then we we'll show the interesting sequence of gateways that were uncovered and crossed. A case study in gateway theory, and I'm going to show you how Q vectors changed ethereal mechanics and how ethereal mechanics changed vectors. It was kind of a, they worked back into each other. It was very interesting. So we take a flashback to ethereal mechanics video number 41. As you recall, we were able to take terms 2, 3, and 5 and work them together into a single equation where we were able to separate the disturbance in the ether with how that ether couples to a secondary target charge. Separating the emission and the coupling was very important. Okay, but now what about the other two? Well, as you recall, we said because these both have, our forces are radial, they look like they're from the same. In other words, they, this was all magnetism before and this was Coulomb. But now we're saying, well, gee, the part of magnetism and part of Coulomb looks like they're part of the same force. And here we are, we're showing it again. And if we do an interesting thing where we substitute that Ke is equal to C squared Km, we put it in this form and then we put them together, then we can join these together. But, you know, what does this look like? I mean, how, did this, what, is, what, how, what kind of sense can we make from this? This almost looks like we have a completing the square, like it's something like, you know, perhaps you know, c squared is the re is the the velocity of the pretons. You know, and it looks something like this, maybe. You know, v s minus v t squared. Okay, or it could also be v s times v s minus v t, or maybe it's v t minus v s. I may have the sign backwards. Okay, which would give us you know v s squared minus v s v t, which looks like this, and this looks like this. You know, which would mean that, you know, because pretons only move at the speed of light, that means a Coulomb model may be just a byproduct of an electron where a preton is stuck in the speed of light orbit. And that there may actually be no real thing as a Coulomb field. Okay, but we have no mathematics that tell us how we get through this. There's something missing in vector mechanics. And I spent a lot of time on this. And before I realized that, gee, you know, we need, we need a real form of vector multiply because there's no such thing as two vectors subtracted from each other squared. That's just not handleable with existing vector mathematics. Okay, and again, I'm re this is reiterating what I just said on the previous slide. Because inertialist particles, pretons, can only move at the speed of light, then the following equation must be a vector equation of some sort involving an unknown form of multiplication. And I just explained that in the previous video. So let's investigate vector multiplication. Given two vectors, a and b, where a is ax plus ay and b is bx plus by, well, let's just do the straight out thing you learned in high school. Simple FOIL. You multiply ax times bx and ax times by and then ay times bx and ay times by. Now from the last video we're like, hey wait a minute, ax bx and ay by is the dot product. And then ax by and ay bx is the cross product. I'm using the right hand rule of course. And so we're like, wow this is awesome. That means that vector multiplication has been hiding in plain sight. It's the two combined together. And this my friend was not explained to me in any um, vec course in mathematics, or maybe it was and I was asleep that day, I don't know. I couldn't find this explanation for where cross and dot products came from uh, anywhere else, but again, I only really looked on Wikipedia, I didn't really look that hard. Okay, but I reason that this must be prior art because it's just so obvious and I just missed it. So I said, that's great. That's like half the battle. But we need to say, pr prove that this is the true result of multiplication because it must provide division. And one of the things about sometimes things just get lost to history. Okay, for example, in, 18, in Maxwell's 1873 work, he states that magnetic fields store kinetic energy and electric fields store potential energy. But when heavy side 
reworked his stuff into vectors, they lost that. Now in electrical engineers, we're just taught energy is energy. We're no distinction of what's kinetic or potential. And there's a lot of things that get lost to history. One of the ones is ether. People believe that the Michael Samorley experiment disproved the ether. No, no, no. Go back and watch the video, you'll find out that the 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 uh, the Lorentz point care compensation oops, v squared over c squared. I believe that's one over. I'm not sure. Uh, I can never remember it. Uh, the v the v in this equation is the velocity of the object relative to the medium, but nobody seems to remember that. Go back and look at the derivation. All they did with the ether was realize that, gee, because of this, if this is true, it only means that nothing we do will, will ever, we can never measure our velocity relative to the ether. That's all they did. So they never, they, why bother talk about it? Okay, and, but that got translated over history is that we disproved the ether, which is completely not the case. Um, and again, uh, when I was doing my graduate, new electromagnetism rather, I came back to the conclusion that um, magnetic fields store kinetic energy, electric fields store potential energy, uh, and I thought I reinvented it. It turned out when I did my graduate uh, research work, I actually went back and read all of Maxwell's stuff and found that he already had that. But in order to prove that this truly is the final word on vector multiplication, okay, it, we have to be able to do vector division with it. I mean, you have to. And it took me many failed attempts, and I thought way in the beginning of this that this was going to be such a simple paper that the math journals would accept it right off the bat. But I spent a lot of time trying to be able to do A times B divided by B to get back to A, and I could not do it. It's ambiguous. You don't have enough information here to do vector division, which means this is not the correct form of multiplication. I mean, it works in trivial cases that we can use as gateways, and we'll show those in a minute. But we don't want a trivial solution. We want a general solution. Okay. Um, and, and people say, well, 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 why do we need a vector division? If, if this works, why, who cares if it doesn't have vector division? Well, according to God, George Burns said, you can't have a top without a bottom. There's a funny movie back in the 80s, I think it was called Oh God with George Burns. And the little girl goes up to George Burns, who's playing God, and says, God, why is there evil in the world? And George Burns said, well, that's funny. You see, I can't make a top without a bottom, and I can't make good without evil. Well, my friends, if you can have multiplication, you have to have division. If this isn't sufficient to, have, to allow, give you enough information to do the inverse process of division, then it's not complete. So, what do we do? Enter reciprocal thinking. This is the cornerstone of ethereal mechanics. If you can't start from the top, then start from the bottom, and like reverse engineering. So let's start from re vector division and work our way backwards. Well, it's kind of a, not really starting from vector, we're kind of starting from the middle. What we're going to do is say, well, given A multiplied B divided by C, um, we want to, what is the general solution for this equation? And then once we get that, we should be able to substitute B to get back to A. Okay, so how do we go forward with this? Well, we can use the prior art, the prior multiplication, as a gateway because in the other one where you had a times b is equal to a dot b plus a cross b if a and b are the same if a and b are the same vector okay you can do vector division on this this is one of the trivial cases and it works because you the the, the, the two vectors in parallel there's no cross component so the dot cross product goes to zero you're only left with the dot product and the dot product of two parallel vectors is just the magnitude squared. Okay, and that's reasonable. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this guy over here and multiply the top and bottom by C so that we're going to turn a division problem back into a multiplication problem. What we're going to do here is because C times C is C squared, it's just a scalar, we're going to ignore this for now because solving this equation is a solution for both multiplication and division. It actually is a multiplication problem, but it's also the solution for division. And for people that may say, well, that's kind of tricky and backhanded, yeah, but, you know, sometimes we have to, as we go on, we'll find that this isn't 100% this isn't true. There's other slight variations that will improve it a little better. It's kind of a gateway to get our foot in the door.
And this idea of dividing top and bottom is kind of copied from uh, complex number theory, where we turn complex division into multiplication. This is a similar technique. So the secret is in A, B times C. So given three vectors, A, B, and C, we're going to compute what's the resultant vector of A, B, and C. And we're going to go on to the next page. And if we permutate these and we do like we did before, we're going to do FOIL. We're going to do A times B and get the four terms and multiply those four terms by C, X, C, Y. We end up with all these terms here. Okay, and the, how we figure out where the output is, we use, again, we use the right-hand rule. Okay, let's take this one here. AX times BY okay, gives us a vector in the Z dimension. So Z times CX would be plus in the Y dimension. So this ends up in the output vector D in its Y dimension. Okay, and if you do this for all of them, X times X is a scalar times X, which you come out X, and you just do this for everybody. And what you'll notice, when I first did this, I looked at this and said, holy crap. This is a matrix. If you use the C as the input, CX, CY, and you use the DX, DY as the output, okay, then if CX, DX, that means AX, BX goes here, and you end up going all the way down like CY, DY, CY, DY, that means AX, BX, and then you go here, uh, CX, DY, and you put AX, BY here, and you just keep going all the way down, okay, you'll end up with a matrix that looks like this. And then if we drop the multiply by C, we find that the true result of multiplying A times B is a matrix. And that also makes sense from a dimensional standpoint as well, not just as the simple algebra we just did here. Okay, this is the first ever incidence where anybody has shown that when you multiply two vectors, the proper result is a matrix. I went back and looked extensively to make sure that no one had this before. Not even geometric algebra has a matrix as a result of the multiply of two vectors. And this material is all copyright, uh, officially copyright, not just stamped with copyright. There's actually been um, paperwork filed. So here's what the important point. We had to multiply three vectors in order to determine what the multiplication true nature of multiplying two vectors is. Okay, because if you just multiply two vectors, you get four terms. You multiply three vectors, you find out that the true multiplication of two vectors is eight terms. And also, that the weird thing about this old method here is that when you multiply everything here, this is meters, assuming x, y, and z are meters, okay, this is meters squared, that's meters squared, that's meters squared, that's meters squared. But this, in old classical theory, comes out to be a scalar, which is unitless. And this comes out to be area, which is meters squared, but we map it into the z dimension, which is not unit squared. I mean, the, the, with this multiplication, your, your vector components go outside of your original vectors. Your original vectors are in X and Y. When you multiply, your results go into Z, which is outside of X and Y, or scalar, which is also outside of X and Y. That's weird. We're losing all our information to other dimensions. In the matrix form, your energy stays in the X and Y dimension, kind of, so that your next vector would bring it all back to A, B, into X and Y, rather. So we retain our information this way. There's no loss of energy to outside dimensions, which doesn't make any sense. And also, because everything here is meters squared, we're all in the same construct, as opposed to two different constructs. So this makes sense from a dimensional standpoint as well. And in the paper that I wrote, I go ad nauseum on the dimensions. And when we get to the uh, next video we're going to start, we're going to go through matrices, because now that we're a matrix, we need to explain to everybody uh, how to use matrices and how matrices re relate to vectors. And I'm going to show you the simplest way in the universe to understand what a matrix is and how to use it more effectively. Okay, again, uh, now if you want to go back and prove 
that this does result in vector division. You can do that on your own. We're going to do it in a later video after we learn what matrices are for those people that are not familiar with matrices. But for you people that are familiar with matrices, just go ahead, multiply this by C, divide by C squared, and then set C and C squared to B and B squared, and you'll learn you'll get the value A back beautifully. Very simple. Now, you're going to find if you substitute A here, you're not going to get the right answer. You're going to get a reflection value. That's where I learned that multiply and divide are right, left sensitive. Okay, so that improved it as we went even further. But we'll get that, that's in later videos. But uh, just realize you're going to get that result if you put A in there, you're going to get a reflection. Okay, important note, notation. Because the proper multiplication of two vectors results in a matrix, we surround the pair with brackets. So we're going to write, if you multiply a vector C times D, we're going to put brackets around to remind us that it's a matrix. This allows us to use matrix operators, and the matrix operators works fine. They work perfectly with the vector AB matrix, and we call this an AB matrix for short. But we'll get into more of that later. This video is starting to get long. We're going to go on to Q now. So a strange thing happens at three dimensions. Dimensions, sorry. If we go through the same thing we did with a two-dimensional vector and we multiply out our, our AX's, BY's, and CZ's, all blah, 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 we're going to get the matrix like we showed before, but now we're going to be left with three extra products that don't fit. Now, according to the left hand, or the, sorry, the right hand rule, okay, we take this one here, we do AX, BY, that's Z. So in the brackets here, it works out to the dimension Z using the right hand rule, but Z times Z ends up being a scalar. Oh crap, now we're losing, we're losing stuff outside of the matrix now, like we did with the old stuff. What's wrong here? This can't be a scalar. Okay, and when you really look at it, uh, and so this whole thing, because it must result in a, in, a, in a vector, this result can't be a scalar. It's got to result in a vector component. So after some time, I realized that these are volume normals. Look, you get AX, BY, CZ. X times Y times Z is volume. We have the first ever volume normals resulting from vector multiplication. So what I did is I appended these volume normals as a fourth dimension. Because just like in, the, in the, the old classical cross product, when you multiply x and y, you get z, which is the third dimension. So if we're multiplying x, y, and z, and we're getting a normal, well, that should be the fourth dimension. That's the logic I used. And so you end up with a 4 by 3, or 3 by 4, depending on how you write it, 4 on this side, 3 matrix for a 3 by 3 three-dimensional multiply. And after much more time, I could not reconcile P with X, Y, and Z to develop a simple rule table. And when I did development, I went beyond three dimensions into four dimensions and five dimensions, all the way up to lots of dimensions, just to see if any other things come out of the woodwork that weren't, you know, just like when I went from two to three, I learned that there's a Q dimension. Well, I wanted to make sure that there wasn't other stuff beyond three. Beyond three, there's no other weird stuff that happens, okay, except for that at four dimensions, the Q dimensions take on both scalar and um, dimensional properties. And therefore, I renamed the, Q, the P dimension to Q dimension for quasi-scalar. And then I realized that if I made the Q dimension the very first dimension, the rule tables work out so simple it's unbelievable. Everything resolves nicely. Okay, and that's where Q vectors get the name. Okay, then I also realized that the gamut of identities that were developed break down without Q in three dimensions. In other words, you need Q for everything at three dimensions and above. For all of the vector property, all of the things to work properly. So Q is a necessary component of vectors. So really in four dimensions, it's not really four dimensions, it's three dimensions plus the quasi-scalar dimension. Now let me just emphasize a point here. The Q dimension is not a fairy tale. It consists of real products from the actual multiply. You saw them, you can go and do all the multiplication yourself and use the right hand rule to try to figure out where everything ends up. Okay. 
but these Q dimensions don't fit into the normal space as, as defined by the classical right-hand rules. Now maybe as time goes on, someone will figure out, well, the Q is really this or that, uh, and bring it back into normal space. It doesn't really matter to me right now. It's enough to get going. But way, the way I look at it right now is that the Q dimension should be treated with the same respect as the imaginary dimension in complex number theory. Yeah, in mathematics we have stuff we don't understand that we use every day to good effect. And that scares me when we use stuff that we don't understand. Okay, everything beyond QXYZ, you know, the fifth and above dimensions, is under further investigation. QXYZ is what we need to c continue ethereal mechanics. So let's see how this has changed ethereal mechanics. Well, this is a little bit out of sequence, but there, uh, there's another, before that last statement, there's Q algebra. Now that there's complete set of four basic operations for vectors, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, this opens the floodgates for pure vector algebraic expressions, what I call Q, Q algebra. Without any ancient arithmetic ambiguities, this leads to vector transcendental functions like the cosine of a vector, what is the natural logarithm of a vector, vector transforms, vector derivatives, integrals take on a slightly different, more precise definition. But let's get back to ethereal mechanics and show you how Q algebra has changed ethereal mechanics. Now, if you remember our rules of acquisition, where this is the electronic echelon, this is at the pretonic echelon, we can't derive down. But we can make a guess down. And so the guess I'm making now is this guy. Remember, we already have this guy from video 41, but we didn't have something for this guy. So I'm taking one half these guys video, times the velocity squared r. This kind of looks like one half inertia, which would be m for people that haven't followed the ethereal mechanics videos, v squared over r, if you work out all the, the numbers, which works out to be force. So we get energy over r. Okay, so let's see, because that's our guess. Okay, and one thing that you should notice that was very interesting is with this guess, there's no longer KE. KE goes away. Now, what I said in my other rules of acquisition is that the true unification of the forces means you're eliminating arbitrary constants of relation. QE is an arbitrary constant of relation. Now, this doesn't mean that everything is now magnetism. This just means that what we saw before, these were the magnetic field, and this was the electric field from before is that all of these effects that we see at the electronic level are synthesized by a single or maybe two different fields at the pretonic level. And I'm calling these pretonic fields, I'm not calling this magnetic field, because a magnetic field would then be the combination of two different, you know, so you can see how it's all mixed up, that what we observe at our echelon may look nothing like the echelon below. I've said that over and over again in the videos. See, that's why you can't just derive down because then you'd have to carry KE with you instead of getting rid of it in order to unify. So anyway, let's now take this equation and derive back up. So we take this equation and we expand this multiplication here and we end up with Vs Vt, Vs squared, and 2 times Vs dot Vt in a matrix. That means that's the new dot product. We're going to cover that in the later videos. The identities which come to this are going to be derived in later videos. We'll show you it's pretty simple. Um, so what we get now is when you multiply a vector times a vector, like we said before, this ends up being a scalar. And if, if these are expressed as in the pretons in an electron, then these velocities are always at the speed of light. So you can just combine these into 2 times c squared, because when you multiply a vector times itself, it's just a scalar. And this carries in with the 2. And we have our one half here, which cancels these. Uh, I'm sorry, which cancels these twos. Okay, then you split this up, and you get the Coulomb model, which this is Ke, and you get the term number three, or is it four? I can't remember. Um, and these are the missing terms that we didn't have before. So simple. Even a physicist can do it. It's just simple uh, Q algebra. 
and this is what it looks like when you put it back. I'll just turn number four. So the we now we have two pretonic equations. Now this isn't complete. We still have to go through the trouble of splitting this up into emission and coupling like we did for the first one. We're not doing this video because this is just this is just showing you them how the math has changed ethereal mechanics. We still have to get through all the other math before we can get to that point. We have to show you all the other identities in Q algebra before we can show you how, to, how we're going to split this up. Uh, but it shows you that all the new electromagnetism terms are now completely defined by two pretonic equations. Now, an interesting thing that's going on, and one of the reasons why there's been some kinds of delays, is this, by exploring Q-algebra, I have found another possibility. Now, remember what I said before, you got all these observations here. These are observations, and right now we have the simple two equation pretonic, but there, there could be a third one which is simpler, or a fifth one, or an eighth one, or there could be an infinite number of Q-algebra solutions. And right now I'm looking at another one where it's a single Q-vector equation, which synthesizes all the electromagnetic effects, plus some extra. And this is still under investigation. But we come to a revelation. Regardless of how the final Q uh, pretonic equations come out, one thing we are understanding for certain right now is that fields are not generated, and this is force, unless pretons are in motion. Which means the concept of a static electric field is bullshit. Ooh, baloney. And ether consumption is related to preton motion, which means that pre stationary pretons don't feed. So pretons are like Pac-Man. And this offers a new possibility, which predates, the uh, not predates, but this would be before the videos I had before on the universe. The universe could be, have begun as a stationary soup of ethons and pretons, where it's kind of like having fuel and air all sitting together, waiting for a spark. And because pretons are stationary relative to ethons, no consumption is occurring. The slightest motion of a single preton would have detonated the entire universe. And that means we are now existing in what would be today the smoldering ashes of that event. And a CUDA simulation is planned to see if this could possibly hold water. Um, very compelling. This would, this would be before the universe, and this would, this would mean that ether was never frozen, which was the original idea, but it does mean that as the universe exploded then, now all this matter is going to clump together in super humongous black holes to cut down ether consumption, and eventually as those black holes started orbiting each other, they would form the galaxies that we see today. That's, again, that's all just theory based on the possibilities offered by what the pretons say. So let's do a recap. Okay, we demonstrated the evolution of Q vectors culminating in Q algebra, which came about because I couldn't reconcile the electromagnetic effects without improving vector algebra. And now we have the first ever unification of electromagnetic equations. There's only one constant of relation, and we may be able to get that down to one equation. And this new form of, of vector algebra has the first ever solution for vector division and the first ever correct solution to vector multiplication, which is a matrix. And we demonstrated the ability of the Q algebra to provide a solution to the missing pretonic equation. We revealed that a single equation solution is under investigation. And if you didn't follow the derivations, more details of Q algebra and Q vectors are in later releases of this Q course. Uh, I just wanted to give you a little flavor for how all this stuff interwork with each other and how it all kind of evolved and how one thing set off another, set off another, and I had to keep going back and restarting from the beginning because as I learned more stuff, I realized other stuff was wrong and it was really an interesting, um, really an interesting development. I'd, I'd never seen anything like that where one thing just kept leading to the other and, and the, the evolution just kept invalidating previous stuff I had and I had to keep changing as I learned more and more as I went on into Q space. Thank you. No more voodoo physics or no more voodoo math. <laughs>